True believer, 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 21. A deacon living in Berkshire Town was requested to give his prayers on behalf of a poor man who had broken his leg and had a large family to support. I can't stop now to pray, he said, while he was pickling and barreling apples for the city market. But you can go down to the cellar and get some corned beef, some salt pork, and potatoes, butter, and that's the best I can do. John in this chapter reminds us that the sign of a true believer loves God is not in the demonstration of spiritual gifts or worship, but in the demonstration of loving one another with acts of kindness. Section A, testing the Spirit. Remain exuberant in the Holy Spirit and for the touchstone of your faith. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. The early church, like today, was experiencing a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit and a manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. In their exuberance, some had began to think that the more a person spoke publicly in tongues and prophesied, the more spiritually they were. Now this allowed for prophetic forgers to come into the church. Now you never think of forgers as being old or in a wheelchair. Well, there's a true story of how the world's experts were fooled by a couple of old age pensioners and their son who lived in a council house in Bolton, England. The trio are called the Artful Codgers. And the word codgers is an English uh, slang for old, eccentric and amusing person. As far as the neighbours were concerned, Olive Greenhay and her wheelchair-bound husband George were much like any other elderly couple just quietly living out their, their years in the council house. But behind the doors of this shabby home, the unassuming pair were masterminding Britain's biggest conspiracy of fake arts and antiquities. In total, the conspiracy secured approximately $1.7 million. For almost two decades, the couple, uh, together with their son from their garden shed, ran a cottage industry in forging sculptures, paintings, and ancient artifacts. Using elaborate cover stories, fabricating up to painstaking art historical research by the father, George, and producing fake documents produced by the mother, Olive, the family fooled experts across the world into believing that they had inherited valuable and famous works. The emergence of these artifacts generate, generated much excitement in the art world. Created by their son, a talented artist, they were sold by the 84-year-old father who persuaded experts from the country's uh, most famous museums, such as the British Museum, and auction houses such as Sotheby's into paying hundreds of thousands of pounds for them. Now their downfall came in November 2005 when the family tried to sell to the British Museum three marble stone reliefs, apparently for about $500,000, from the Assyrian Palace of Sennacherib, dating back to about 681 BC. Greenhage Sr. Uh, claimed that they had been in his family since his childhood. Hieroglyphic style writing experts noticed that the KI sign lacked one single wedge right at the very top. They said such a mistake would never be permitted on a piece destined to the eyes of the king. Now you would think that these people would be basking in the lap of luxury, but when the police arrived they, to arrest the family, they found George the father very unwell and the family living in poverty. The British Museum and Sotheby's, in their exuberance to have these objects, failed to undertake proper historical archaeological investigation to confirm the vandality of what they were looking at and they were fooled. Now this experience didn't dampen their exuberance. As historical archaeologists, again they took up the responsibility of properly testing all sculptures, paintings and ancient artefacts for forgeries. John's point here is that we are not to lose our exuberance for the things of the Holy Spirit or the touchstone of our faith, which is the incarnation of Jesus Christ, because there are spiritual forgers. Section 1. The touchstone of our faith, verses 1 and 2. One of the central messages of John in his first letter is the Holy Spirit's continued affirmation of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. 
1.1, maintain your exuberance in the Holy Spirit. John tells us not to believe every spirit that you hear. And the word spirit here either means a utterance by a spirit or a person inspired by a spirit. John is telling us or telling the believers not to believe every utterance by a spirit. Every person who claims to be inspired by a spirit. Just because a person speaks in tongues and prophesies doesn't make them a true messenger of God. Rather, he says that we have a responsibility of testing the spirits. Now, the Greek word that's used here is the word used for testing metal. In particular, undertaken by metal urgulars of testing the genuineness of a coin to see if it met the required satisfaction. One of the way that metal urgulars would test the genuineness of a coin for gold or silver was by rubbing it on a black stone. It was called a touchstone. By the streaks left on the stone, they were able to determine if the coin was pure gold or silver. We need to understand that John isn't telling us to quell our exuberance for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our midst. Rather, it's the opposite. He wants us to be more sensitive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we believers, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are called to be spiritual mental urgulars. Well, how is this accomplished? It's through the work of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, Jesus tells us that the Holy Spirit's mission is divided into two parts. The first part is to guide us into all truth. And the word guide in the context here means to show the way or to influence someone. While the word truth means uh, more than an academic knowledge of something, but refers to a deep appreciation of truth or an experience. As the world's fastest blind runner, David Brown of the US Paralympic team credits his wins to God, his mother's early advice not to sit around and to do nothing, and his running guide, the veteran sprinter, Jeremy Avery. Tethered to Brown by a string tied to their fingers, Avery guides Brown to win races by words and touches. It's all about listening to the cues, says Brown. Day in and day out, we're going over the race strategies. Brown communicates with each other, not only with verbal cues, but with physical cues. David Brown could have used his blindness as an excuse to lose his exuberance and enthusiasm for life and just to sit around. But he took up his mother's advice and took up a responsibility for his life and took up running. No matter how exuberant he was about running, running for a blind person can have some dire consequences. David Brown had to tether himself with a piece of string to the veteran springer, J sprinter Jeremy Avery and to listen, listen not only to the verbal cues but to the physical cues of Jeremy Avery to become the world's fastest blind runner. John doesn't want us to lose our exuberance for the things of the Holy Spirit. And as David Brown's mother encouraged him to get up and run, John is encouraging us to get up and to run in the Christian race. Not as a blind person without a guide, but like David Brown, tethered to the great runner Jeremy Avery, we are to tether ourselves to the Holy Spirit as the one who leads us into all truth by listening to his voice and cues to keep us on track. 1.2. Glorifying Christ's deity and incarnation. Now remember the artful codgers. They were caught out as forgers when experts noticed that the hieroglyphic writing relief that was supposed to be designated for the king Shunakabib didn't glorify the king because the KI sign lacked a single diamond wedge at the top. The expert said such a mistake would never have been permitted to be displayed before a king. Now Jesus tells us in John 16, 14, that the second part of the Holy Spirit's mission is not to speak of himself, but to glorify Christ. What glory is Christ speaking about? It's the glory that he had before he permanently took on human form. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, in John 17, verse 5, before going to the cross, praise this. O Father God, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. And in the context it means that the Holy Spirit will glorify the incarnation of Christ. To have the glory and the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in Jesus Christ as the second member of the Trinity is to ascribe the same works and worship to him as the Father.
Coming back to our text in 1 John chapter 4, verse 2, John says, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. And the word has come means that the speaker believes in the pre-existence of Jesus Christ before his incarnation. When linked with the words in the flesh means that Jesus Christ and his incarnation was truly united with human flesh forever. This is brought out by the word come, which in the Greek is in the present tense and speaks of a completed action emphasizing that the human body that Christ assumed at his incarnation has become his permanent possession. It is not so much a confession of the historical fact, namely that Jesus was born into the world in a human body, but rather it's a confession of the living person, Jesus Christ, come in the flesh. Now why is such a confession so important? It's because the whole assurance of our faith rests upon the incarnation of Christ. In the incarnation of Christ, God moved towards humanity. To deny Jesus is truly God, at the same time truly man, is to deny the Christian faith. To deny either Jesus' deity or his humanity is to deny that he is our saviour. If he were not God, he would, not, he would have been a sinner and his death on the cross could not have atoned for our sins. If Jesus Christ had not been a man, he could not have been touched with our weaknesses and our inadequacies. Therefore, he could not have been our advocate with the Father, nor our great High Priest. The crowning and consistent work of the Holy Spirit is the spiritual illumination and glorification of Jesus Christ that leads people to salvation and to honour Jesus Christ. Any teaching, any prophecy or working of miracles that does not glorify Jesus Christ as truly God, the second member of the Trinity, finds its origin in the spirit of the Antichrist. Nothing is to distract from the glorification of Christ. When Leonardo da Vinci had painted his timeless Last Supper, he asked a friend for evaluation. The friend heaped superfluous on the masterpiece, a special praise on the wine cup in the Lord's hand. At that point, Leonardo leapt to his feet, grabbed a paintbrush and blotted out the cup. His friend stood dumbfounded. Leonardo turned to him and shouted, Nothing! should distract one's attention from the Lord. Leonardo da Vinci focused attention solely on Christ by removing the distraction of the cup. Having removed the cup, he had to do something with the hand. The left hand was already outstretched above the table, lifted as a blessing command. Now the right hand also was empty, outstretched as an invitation. As shown by Leonardo da Vinci, of Christ's two arms extended as an invitation, the church is not an exclusive group of believers. As the supreme head of the church and the one who's conquered death, Jesus Christ is extending an invitation to all to come to him. By changing the position of Christ's hand to that of an invitation, Leonardo is doing this. He brought the glorification back to Christ. David Brown took up the responsibility of his life. But that responsibility had to be tethered to Jeremy Avery. So we are also responsible for tethering our exuberance for the things of God to the Holy Spirit. David Brown didn't have a profound appreciation of running until he was tethered to Jeremy Avery. Every day through listening to the words and the cues from Jeremy Avery, his appreciation and confidence in the sport of running grew. As we tether our exuberance to the Holy Spirit, listening to his words and cues, guiding us through life, our appreciation and confidence in the work of the incarnation of Christ will grow stronger each day and Christ will be glorified. Section 2. The Holy Spirit in energizing us to overcome the spirit of the Antichrist. Verses 3 and 4. Most people don't think about singing when they think about a revolution. But song was the weapon of choice by the Estonian, Latvian, and Lithuanians sought to free themselves from the decades of Soviet occupation. It's a story of humanity's irresistible drive for freedom. In 1987 and 1991, that led to the restoration of independence of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. In the face of threats and hostile violence against them, in which many were injured and died, 
as well as the hostile military exercises on their borders by the Soviet Union. Thousands of people regularly gathered in a public place and sang national songs and Roman Catholic hymns of praise to God that glorify Christ. Eventually, the mighty force of the Soviet Union had to capitulate to these small nations and gave them their independence. Why? Because there was a greater force for self-determination in these small nations than in the authoritarian force of the Soviet Union. The Estonian artist Heinz Volk wrote in 1988, a nation who makes its revolution by singing and smiling should be a sublime example for all. And as we look at the sublime example of these small nations, we better understand the words of John in 1 John chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. 2.1. We face a hostile force. These small nations sang hymns and glorified God as they faced a superior power that wished to destroy them. We, the church, face a superior power of the Antichrist who wishes to destroy the very touchstone of our faith. John tells us that every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God and is of the spirit of the Antichrist. The name Jesus refers to his humanity. The name Christ refers to his deity. And the words not confess in the Greek, according to Greek scholars, uh, carries the meaning to separate, to free, to destroy, to loose, or to annul. Therefore, not to confess Jesus has come in the flesh is to loose him. That is to divide Jesus from Christ, or to separate the divinity of Christ from the humanity of Christ, which in fact is to annul or to destroy the true teachings concerning Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can translate the first half of this verse as something like this. Every spirit that separates the humanity of Jesus from the deity of Christ is not of God. Or every spirit that annuls or destroys the true teaching concerning Christ is not of God. John then goes on to say that such a spirit finds its place or origin in the rebellious nature of the Antichrist, who is the instigator of the supreme lie that Jesus is not the Son of God. There's a story of a Navy pilot who was describing his complex helicopter to his parents one day. And he told them that a small hexagon nut held the main rotor on the mast of the helicopter. Guess what the nut's called? He asked his mother. Well, she can only shrug her shoulders. With a smile, the pilot said, and he answered his own question, it's called the Jesus nut. If this small piece of metal ever came off, the helicopter would not be able to stay in the air, but would come crashing down to the ground. So it's understandable why the pilots in Vietnam gave this little part the Jesus nut. They said if it came loose, there was only one thing to do, and that was to pray to Jesus. To undo or to loosen the Jesus nut of the helicopter was a calculated action, action of aggression against those flying in the helicopter. Like the Soviet Union suppression of Estonia and Lithuania, and Latvia was a calculated act of aggression. John is in no doubt that those who deny the apostolic confession about Jesus Christ is not merely an intellectual error but a calculated action of aggression against the church by the spirit of the Antichrist. Yet John assures us of our victory against the aggressive powers of the Antichrist that wish to destroy the touchstone of our faith which is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. 2.2 We are victorious through the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 Speaking of the Holy Spirit, John says, Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. 2.21 Powers of darkness assaulted. You will notice something else about these three nations, that they sang songs that glorified God and Jesus Christ with their voices. When thousands of people regularly gather in a public place, praising God, there is a spiritual impact in the heavenlies against those demonic forces that are trying to destroy them. These songs of their confession set them free from oppression. As we glorify Christ as one who is God, the second member of the Trinity, who took on human form, and brought us salvation by his death and resurrection 
We break the powers of darkness over our lives, over the church, over our community, and people are set free from the powers of sin. 2.22, our spiritual heritage. As those nations found strength in who they were, that is their heritage, we find strength in who we are. John says that we are from God. John is telling us to never forget our spiritual heritage. We are children of God. The word children in the Greek literally means born ones or ones who bear the nature of another and in this case, God's nature. 2.23 We are overcomers. These three nations by singing prevailed in spite of the fact they faced an insurmountable obstacle of the Soviet Union. So great was their victory that in 2003 their songs of celebration were inscribed in UNESCO's list of masterpieces of intangible cultural heritage of humanity. John says that we have overcome. The Greek word overcome here means to conquer, to be victorious or to prevail in the face of obstacles. The word overcome is one of John's favourite words. In fact, he uses it seven times in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 12 verses 10 and 11, John records the song of the saints, which identifies how the saints achieved their victory over Satan, not by their own efforts, but by Christ's blood. And they sing in verse 11 that they overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb. Now this verse has been the inspiration of many a sermon and two, many a sermon and two ageless, magnificent hymns that when sung with conviction can lift the floor of any auditorium. And they are... Nothing about the blood composed by Robert Lowry. And the other hymn is, There is Power in the Blood, written by Lewis Jones. Praise God that the one-time sacrifice of the Lamb of God justifies us for all eternity. Satan's accusation towards a believer is essentially nullified by the forgiveness of sins and the righteousness of Christ. When John uses the word overcome to describe believers, us who acknowledge and glorify Christ, who came in the flesh and made an atonement for our sins. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania have their songs of celebration inspired, inscribed in UNESCO's list of masterpieces of intangible cultural heritage of humanity, whilst our songs of victory echo for all eternity in heaven. 2.24, Indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Those small nations overcome the great power of the Soviet Union because of their inner strength, while our strength to overcome the powers of darkness is not due to our inner strength, but rather to the fact the one who lives in us is greater. The Holy Spirit is more powerful than the one at work in the world. This is the reason for our victory over the Antichrist. Although the spirit of the Antichrist is great, the Holy Spirit is greater. And the word greater in the Greek here means superior in every way. Because we are the children of God and the superior power of the Holy Spirit dwells in us, the church has a powerful song of redemption that glorifies the incarnation of Christ, which no aggressive force of the Antichrist can withstand. We have a wonderful song of incarnation of Christ that breaks the powers of darkness over lives, over the church, over our community and sets people free. This is the message of the gospel we proclaim. John says that you are of God. We are of God. We have received an inner power of truth, as stated in 1 John chapter 2, 18 to 27, that enables us to more than just withstand error, but to overcome it. That is to conquer it. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the comforter that Jesus promised us in John 16, illuminates our mind to grasp truth and to reject error. Our confidence for such a victory over the forerunners of the Antichrist does not lie in our own strength, but in the one who dwells in us, the Holy Spirit, who is greater than he that's in the world. Point three, where our strength lies. 1 John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Downhill skiing racing courses are often marked by switches of blue paint sprayed across the white snowy surface. Now these crude arcs might be a visual distraction for spectators, but they prove to be both vital both to the success and safety of the competitors. The paint serves as a guide for the racers to visualize the fastest line to the bottom of the hill. 
Additionally, the contrast of the paint against the snow offers races depth perception, which is critical to their safety when traveling at such high speeds. The blue line in the snow brings assurance to the skiers that they are safe and on the right course. John, as it were, gives us a blue line of contrast of those who are empowered by the Holy Spirit and those that are driven by the Spirit of the Antichrist. 3.1. They are of the world seeking to glorify themselves. Verse 5. First John tells us that those who deny the incarnation of Christ are of the world. That means that they seek happiness and life by following the world system of transferring the glory that was due to the Son of God to themselves. Remember the artful codgers? In order to find life and happiness, they transferred the glory and honor and respect due to true archaeologists to themselves by producing forgeries of priceless art and antiquities. When the police finally caught up with them, instead of finding them basking in luxury, they found them living in poverty despite of their ill-gotten gain. So we can recognize those who deny the incarnation of Christ by the fact they live in spiritual poverty, unlike the believer who lives lives in the richness and the presence of the Holy Spirit. John identifies these false teachers in verse 5 as they who receive the inspiration from the world. And the word world, when taken in context, refers to the rebellious nature of humanity against God, His Son, which of course is instigated by Satan and propagated by the spirit of the Antichrist. Receiving their inspiration from the rebellious Antichrist world, these false prophets play to their audience, rejecting the divine human person of Jesus Christ, assuring their listeners that it's all right to continue in habitual sin as there is no such thing as accountability to God. 3.2. Embrace the Scriptures. Verse 6. In contrast to those driven by the Antichrist, John says that we are of God and he who knows God hears us. And the word knows in Greek is in the present tense and it describes one who keeps on getting acquainted with God, one who is growing in their knowledge of God. This is not a mere intellectual knowing about God, but a personal relationship, a living experience that impacts the mind, heart and soul. Such a person, John says in verse 6, hears us. John is speaking of the believer who embraces the Word of God, who firmly believes and lives according to it. And therefore it follows that all those acknowledge the divine human person of Jesus Christ will listen to the message of the apostles. Jesus himself taught that there is an affinity between God's Word and God's people. He said that his sheep hear his voice in John 10. It is through the teaching of the apostles found in scriptures that the believer hears the voice of the Good Shepherd and finds true satisfaction in life. By embracing the Word of God, we have a touchstone that enables us to know the difference between truth and error. I read a story about a swan that was walking on the shores of a lake and a wolf came out and ran after the swan and would have torn it to pieces. But the swan said to himself, I'm not strong on the land, but I'm strong in the water. So he plunged into the lake and swam out. And when the wolf followed him into the water, with his strong bill, he gripped the wolf by his ears and pulled his head under the water and drowned it. As the strength of the swan to overcome the wolf was on the water, so John points out that our strength to remain exuberant in the Holy Spirit and holding on to the touchstone of our faith, which is the incarnation of Jesus Christ, is in listening to the apostles and the scriptures. As the strong bill of the swan was able to drown the wolf, the message of the incarnation of Jesus Christ overcomes all powers of the Antichrist. Our blue line for identifying spiritual forges and to overcome the Antichrist attack on the church is the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. The Antichrist spirit has but one aim which is to destroy the gospel that the Son of God came to save humanity. In the face of this aggressive attack, John encourages us not to lose our exuberance for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Rather, he wants us to take up our responsibility of tethering our exuberance to the Holy Spirit, just as David Brown took hold of that responsibility of tethering himself to the great runner, Jeremy Avery, in order to become a world champion runner. 
So we have the responsibility in this time and age of tethering ourselves to the Holy Spirit as the one who leads us into all truth, listening to his voice and cues, cues to keep us on track. As the children of God, we have a powerful song of redemption that glorifies the incarnation of Christ. Through the superior power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, we have a song, a message that breaks the powers of darkness over our lives, over the church and over community and sets people free. Section B, love one another, chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. John bases his appeal for us to love one another upon the supreme demonstration of love seen in God sending his son for us. Verse 7 and 8. One could summarize these two verses in one sentence. To love one another is to show that we are not only born of God, but have a conscious relationship with him. John begins by telling us to love one another. Otherwise, we eventually become like a little girl who spent the whole day fighting with the sister. That evening, they prepared for bed. Still mad at each other, as usual, they knelt by their beds for their prayers. Dear God, the eight-year-old began. Bless mummy, bless daddy, bless the cat and dog. Then she stopped. Her mother gently prodded. Didn't you forget somebody? She glared across the bed at her six-year-old sister and added these words. Oh yes, God, God bless my ex-sister. Bible scholars tell us to love, as used here, actually means to love one another in such a way that it becomes a habit. Love, as used here, is an action, and John is urging us to keep on loving others, so much so that we become a normal practice in our lives, something which not only had to be learned by the older sister, but also by us, the believers. Now, we need to clarify any misunderstanding at this point. John is not so foolish as to think that love is unknown or unpracticed in the world, nor is he saying that everyone who demonstrates love is of God, for he's already stated that belief in Jesus is necessary in 1 John 3.23. Rather, he is affectionately appealing to his readers, you and I, to remember that Christians are known by the fact that they love one another with a love that finds its origin and source in God and acts accordingly. Such actions show that we are not only born of God, but we have a continuous relationship with God. John points out in verse 8, For if a person claims to know God, and is not transformed into a person who loves their brother and sister in Christ, then they're a fraud. Verses 9 and 10. John, in order to safeguard us from confusing God's love with inferior human love, points to the historical count of God sending his son to die for us so that we might have life. In this world, love is seen as a reciprocal process. You give your best and you deserve the same back. It's based on mutual respect. When a person can speak from the depth of their heart, they expect others to listen respectfully and never attack or withdraw. But this is not the case when God decided to demonstrate his love to us. In the environment to which the Son of God came, there was no reciprocation in process, no meeting God halfway. Into a hostile environment, God sent his only Son to those who did not love him, in response to the act of love, some rejected his son. Others withdrew from his son because their deeds were evil, preferring dark darkness. But as many as received him gave the right to become sons of God. John goes on to show us that the greatest demonstration of God's love was not in the incarnation of Christ, but in the atonement in which the incarnate Christ died physically for our sins. Here the love of God is seen in the costliness of the self-sacrifice of sending his only son to become a propitiation for our sins that is an object of his divine wrath so that we undeserving sinners might receive life. Verse 11. John continues in this verse saying that since the love of God has been so graphically displayed in our midst, how can we not love one another? For the love of God has been equally displayed in each of us. Therefore, to love one another is to love God as he has loved us. Verse 12. This verse contains two wonderful promises. John says that even though we are unable to see who God is, 
As we love one another, God abides in us. That is to say that we have the permanent fellowship with an invisible God. The word abide in the Greek means to take up permanent residence. Now this fellowship leads to the second blessing, which God's love being perfected in us, which means it's brought to maturity through the exercise of loving one another. Jack Kelly, a foreign affairs editor for the US paper today, tells the following story. He says we were in Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia, during the famine. It was so bad we walked into one village and everyone was dead. There was a stench of death that gets in your hair, it gets in your skin, it gets into your clothes, and you just can't wash it out. We saw a little boy, and you could tell that he had worms and he was malnutrition. His stomach was protruding. When children are extremely malnutrition, their hair turns red and their skin becomes crinkled as though he's an old man of a hundred years. Our photographer had a grapefruit, which he gave the boy. The boy was so weak he didn't have enough strength to even hold it. So we cut it in half and gave it to him. He picked it up, looked at as, us as if to say thanks, and began to walk back towards the village. We walked behind him in a way that he couldn't see us. When he entered the village, there on the ground was a little boy who I thought was dead. His eyes were completely glazed over. It turned out to be the younger brother. The older brother knelt down next to the younger brother, broke up a piece of the grapefruit, chewed it, and then opened up the mouth of the younger brother and put the grapefruit into it and moved the jaws of the younger brother. Now we learn later that the older brother had been doing this to the younger brother for two weeks. A couple of days later, the older brother died of malnutrition and the younger brother lived. I remember driving home that night thinking what Jesus meant when he said, there is no greater love than to lay down our life for someone else. John's point is that although we cannot see God, who is spirit, we can see the evidence of his abiding in us. When, we, when love is demonstrated in a relationship, one with another and others. The writer Cardius in about 210 AD said of Christians, they know one another by secret marks and signs. They love one another almost before they know one another. The Greek writer Lucan in around 200 AD said this of the early church. It's incredible to see the fervor with which the people of this religion help each other in their wants. They spare nothing. Their first legislator, Jesus, put it in their heads that they're all brethren. It's true. Jesus has put in our heads that we're all brethren. Even before we have the wonderful opportunity of meeting each other, we are known by the fact that we love one another and will spare nothing for one another. Section C, Grounds of Our Assurance, chapter 4, verses 13 to 21. John now goes on to explain more fully the two wonderful promises contained in the previous verse of 1 John 4, 12, that God dwells in us and we dwell in God. Section 1, the witness of the Holy Spirit and the apostles. Chapter 4, verses 13 to 16. The grounds of assurance that God dwells in us and we dwell in God is firstly affirmed by the dual witness of the Holy Spirit and the apostles. Verse 13. John begins with the witness of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. The Christian life is not a matter of subscribing to certain doctrines. At its root, Christianity is receiving a new life from the Holy Spirit. The moment we accept Christ as Savior, we are born of the Spirit, and He, the Holy Spirit, comes uh, to indwell the believer, assuring us that we are a child of God. Paul, writing in Galatians 4, 6, says these words, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The picture that is portrayed in the Greek is of a cry rising from the depth of our being, rising higher and higher like an eagle, rising from the canyon floor. And its cries begin to echo off the mountains. The cry, Abba, Father, rises from the depth of our being until it echoes throughout all of heaven. John says, by this we know, and the words we know emphasize an inward conscious knowledge, which is the common privilege to all true believers. John, like Paul, assures us of the indwelling of God in us and of us living in God by the inner assurance of the witness of the Holy Spirit crying from the very depths of our being. Verses 14 to 15. John now moves to the apostles where he says that we have seen. That is that John and his fellow apostles, 
were the primary witnesses to the life and ministry of Jesus. Therefore, uh, were uniquely qualified to testify of God the Father's love in sending His Son to be the Savior of the world. John continues in verse 15 and says that they can confirm that whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, then God abides in them and they in God. Of course, the outward confession is based upon an inward conviction that Jesus came in the flesh and died for our sins. Though not clearly stated in the verse, it's certainly inferred based on what John has said in verses 1 and 3 and 13 to 14. That the proof that God dwells in us and we dwell in Him is that it is only by the witness of the Holy Spirit in our being that we're able to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. That is that Jesus has come in the flesh. The witness of the Holy Spirit and the witness of the apostles cannot be separated. They are uniquely locked together. Because the apostles were the divine inspired human authors that God used to bring us the scriptures on which our faith is based. Verse 16. The experience of faith come together in this verse. John says that we know that's experience and we believe. John is reminding us firstly that we have the experience of life which is the proof of God's tender loving kindness towards us. John elaborates on this in his own gospel. And he says in his gospel chapter uh, John chapter 1 verse 16 and of his fullness we have received grace for grace now John is telling us that every believer has received the fullness of Christ's grace let's look at some key words here the first word is fullness and the Greek word is plamoral and it means to be full to overflowing next is the phrase grace for grace or blessing upon blessing bringing the two phrases together the picture presented to us is of a fountain of grace bubbling over, overflowing its sides with an inexhaustible supply of God's grace to more than to meet the needs of our lives. To John, the Christian life is an adventure in which we are continually discovering the inexhaustible supply of God's grace. Just when we think we've exhausted all of God's goodness upon our lives, we round the corner of life pass through another experience only to find another fresh supply of his triumphant grace to see us through. What is amazing, it is never the same experience of grace. The grace he supplies is different at different stages of life. The grace we experience as a young person is not the same we experience as we're older. The grace we experience in times of disappointment is not the same as we experience in moments of success. John says in John's Gospel 1.16, grace for grace, which carries the thought of something in exchange for or substitute for. In other words, as one blessing is used up, a fresh one is substituted to take its place. The blessing and grace of God is not limited to one event in time, and, that, and that's all there is. Nor is it limited to one type of experience. God does not resurrect an old used up grace from the past and give it to us again. No, here we see from Scripture that whatever crisis or experience we pass through in life, there is a new dimension of grace of God to carry through in a measure that we've never before experienced. His grace, like His blessings, are ever new. Coming back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, John reminds us of our faith. He says that we believed. And based on our experience of life, we know God too well to doubt Him now. Our faith has a sure foundation. John says that God is love. For since God is eternal, then His love is forever. Once Charles Spurgeon went to visit a farmer, and on the farm he noticed a weather vane, and on the weather vane was written the words, God is love. Turning to the farmer, he said, Do you think that God's love is as changeable as the weather? The farmer paused for a moment and then quietly said, Sir, you've missed the point. No matter which way the wind blows, God is love. His love never changes. All his acts and all his purposes are consistent with his love. Therefore, the only way to live eternally is to live in God's love and for God to live in us. This is the eternal destiny that God had for all humanity before creation and which is achieved 
through his great act of love, sending his Son as our Redeemer. Therefore, the assurance of our salvation is based upon the following. Our love for one another. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit crying, Abba, Father, from the depths of our beings. The witness of the Holy Spirit. Our personal experience of God's grace in our lives and our faith and belief in God's unchanging nature of love. Without such evidence, our hearts would remain cold and our spirits unenlightened. Section 2. God's love inspires maturity and confidence. Chapter 4, verses 17 to 21. John, echoing the theme of 1 John chapter 4, verse 12b, points out in these verses that the demonstration of God's love being perfected or matured in us that is that we have a confidence before God and secondly, that we love one another. Verses 17 to 19. John says, love has been perfected amongst us. And the word perfected in the Greek is teleos, and it's an adjective referring to something going through necessary stages to reach an end goal or a spiritual journey, often illustrated by an old naval telescope extending outward one section at a time to reach its full strength or effectiveness. John pulls out the extension of the telescope of our spiritual journey of perfection and by the Holy Spirit points out that the first expression of maturity and love for God is that we suddenly have an overwhelming confidence to face our Maker on the Day of Judgment without fear or torment of punishment. As John says that we can come with boldness, that is without fear in the Day of Judgment. Now this confidence is based on two things. First, because He, Jesus, is so are we in the world. Now this does not mean that we are sinless, but rather it means that we do not belong to this world of rebellion because we have a relationship with God as Jesus. We are co-heirs with him as sons of God. Secondly, we have no fear of anticipated punishment because our love relationship between ourselves and our judge. John says in verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. There exists such an attraction between us and God, such a perfect union between the believer and God, that excludes fear of punishment, torment and reprisal on the day of judgment from God to the point that it cannot exist. Fear, evil trivially, cast out of love, of our love relationship with God. There is a painting by Max Gabriel which seems to illustrate and represent John's words. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The original is in the Louvre in Paris and it's called The Last Token. And it describes a scene in the days when to be a Christian meant persecution, suffering and death. One of the Christians, a slender, beautiful young woman, is about to be torn apart by a beast. And to her side is a great wall of an amphitheatre, rising tier above tier and crowded with a brutal multitude. The iron grating into the den of a wild animal is lifted and a ferocious tiger Enraged by captivity, hunger is stealthily creeping out of the cage towards this helpless victim, with blood lust in its glaring eyeballs. The young woman is dressed in white and a dark mantle about her head and shoulders. She stands only a few feet from the opening of which the tiger is coming, but she seems oblivious to its nearness. At her feet lies a white rose. Some friend or lover or relative has thrown it into the arena. With her upturned, fearless eyes, eagerly scanning the benches above for the face of him who has cast the rose. The hate of humanity has condemned her to death. The savage beast will soon taste her blood. But one single rose, one beating heart of love behind it has changed the whole scene. Now there is no beast no bloody sounds, no jeering mob, only a white rose, love triumphant. Perfect love casts out fear. John reminds us that the existence of our love relationship with our God and judge is not something 
for which we can take credit. For John plainly tells us in verse 18 that it was initiated by God himself. The daily realisation of how much God loves us brings about in our being an ir almost irresistible obligation to love God in return. In, and in this exercise we find that our love is perfected for him and for one another daily. Verses 20 and 21. Still continue with the illustration of the telescope to describe the spiritual journey of perfection. John now extends the meaning of mature love to another level. And he says it's demonstrated in our love one for another. In Charles Schultz's classic, Linus has just told Lucy he plans to become a doctor. Lucy stops skipping rope and offers her usual constructive criticism. That's the big laugh. You can never be a doctor. You know why? And then she turns back to skipping. Then offers her acid analysis of Linus. Because you don't love mankind. That's why. Linus, with a straight back and obviously disrupted countenance, comes back in his defense. I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. Lucy's point about humanity and people is the same as John's point about God and the church. It is impossible to love God and to hate your brother and sister in Christ because God dwells in each of us and we dwell in God. And you cannot have one without the other. Perfect love not only drives out fear, but it also drives out hatred. John drives home his point here. That our love for our unseen Lord is not only expressed in words and worship, but in deeds of love one for another, those whom we've seen. The phrase have seen in the Greek carries the thought of something that is continually before our eyes. John says that we have seen one another, and he does not mean a casual glance, but rather is speaking of a close-knit fellowship of a, of a local church that provides ample opportunity to serve one another in love. If a person says they love God and yet does not take up ample opportunity to serve the brethren, then their actions or their lack of loving actions show that they are a liar and not of God, and God does not dwell in them. For John, it's impossible to love God and to hate your brother at the same time because it's harder to love someone that you've never seen than to love someone that you have seen. John ends this section with a command. He who loves God must love his brother also. We notice that John says we must love his brother. For our love for God is inseparable from our love for one another. Failure to express love for one another through acts of kindness and sacrifice falls far short of really loving God. Our love for one another has and will always be the church's testimony of the transforming power of Christ in our lives in a world of hatred and self-concern and sin. Conclusion. The story is told of a church that recently called or appointed a new pastor. On his first Sunday in the pulpit, the church was packed. Hopes ran high as the folks prepared to hear his first sermon. Naturally, they had prayed that their new pastor would be a dynamic, gifted preacher. And they were not disappointed. His text was from John 13, verse 34, where Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. The sermon was splendid. The new pastor proclaimed the word of God with eloquence and grace. When it was all over, everyone breathed a sigh of relief especially the members of the pastoral nominating uh, committee who exchanged glances of approval. The next Sunday, the people gathered in anticipation for another sermon. But to their dismay, he repeated the sermon from the week before. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. At the first, the folks were stunned. Didn't we hear their sermon last Sunday? They thought to themselves. Then they began to reason, no, it's certainly similar but there must have been some subtle differences from the week before. Uh, he's a clever fellow. He's used the same text, but has altered the sermon ever so slightly as to emphasize another point. Next time we'll listen more carefully. Wow, this is some preacher we've got here. Well, sure enough, the third Sunday, the people gathered as before, and unbelievably, the pastor preached the exactly same sermon from the previous two Sundays. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. This time there was no mistake. He was clearly repeating himself. The elders gathered hastily after church and demanded an explanation. What in heaven's name is going on, they asked. 
the preacher replied going on what do you mean Jesus was clear that you love one another just like I have loved you and when you do this I'll give you my next sermon it's just a story but it contains an element of truth love is the basis of the Christian life if we don't live in love with one another nothing else matters 